Is that my cue, Bill? That's your cue. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome. This is our 2021 Friends of Edgewood General Meeting. I'm Peter Ingram, your current board president. Thanks so much for setting aside this time to Zoom with us today. For a second year in a row, we would much rather be with you at our annual picnic and the meeting in the preserve. That happy event has been an annual tradition for over a quarter of a century. However, the pandemic continues to preempt our normal lives. And so we've given this year's meeting the theme, Great Adaptation. As we will hear today, this all-volunteer organization, like the Flora and Fauna of Edgewood, is adapting to the many challenges of the pandemic in our rapidly changing environment. Let's get started with some helpful hints for you so that you can maximize your experience of this virtual session. First, we recommend that you set your Zoom view settings to side-by-side -side speaker in the upper right-hand corner of your Zoom screen. This will let you see the slides uh, as large as possible. During the meeting, you can use the chat feature of Zoom to communicate privately with our designated tech support person if you're experiencing any technical difficulties. Just click on the chat button, type in your question or issue, and direct it to tech support. And finally, if you have a question at any time during the presentations today or a general comment you would like to share, please feel free to use the same process and direct the chat to our designated chat manager. So at this time, I'd like very much to recognize the 2021 Board of Directors. They are Lori Alexander, Sally, uh, Sally Sandy Bernhardt, sorry, Kathy Goforth, Bill Korbholtz, Kathy Korbholtz, Linda Leong, our secretary, Angela Mallett, our treasurer, Perry McCarty, Barry Moore, our vice president. And again, I'm Peter Ingram, your current president. Also in virtual attendance is one of our very favorite biologists, Crystal Niederer. Her colleague, Dr. Stuart Weiss, and their firm, Creekside Science, provide a range of consulting services that support Project 467. We're gonna hear from Crystal in just a few minutes. Before we continue, let me pause to see if there's any questions that have come through from our chat manager. We have, we have no questions. Okay, then I think we'll just dive right in. So, Great Adaptations 2021. In ecology, adaptation refers to the process of making adjustments in behavior, physiology, or structure to become more suited to the altered environmental conditions. The term came from the Latin adapto, meaning I fit or I just to. It may also be defined as the state reached by a biological population undergoing adjustments or changes. Adaptation may also pertain to the trait that made the species a better fit for the environment. The trait is referred to as the adaptive trait. For a trait to be, adapt be an adaption, it has to be hereditary, transferable, functional and produce increased fitness. So far, 2021 has required a range of adaptations that I would like to talk about in the context of our longstanding strategic priorities. I'm hoping all of you will conclude that these are indeed great adaptations. And speaking of adaptations, there are no giants, warriors, or earthquake games today. There is a 49ers game that started earlier. Non-scientific speculations suggest that in the past, the 49ers fans may not have attended our in-person meetings. Because of Zoom, however, they may be able to attend this meeting while watching the game, an adaptation enabled by COVID. If you're exhibiting this trait, please stay muted so we're not updated when the 49ers are scoring. The Friends strategic priorities can be viewed as place, people, and infrastructure. Place. Restore, preserve, and protect Edgewood's natural resources. People, inspire stewardship of Edgewood by offering educational and interpretive natural history programs for people of all ages. Infrastructure, strengthen our organization to better support our priorities. First, place. 
Crystal's going to tell us about the Green Grass Initiative and what we've learned in year one of our grasslands restoration experiment. This effort, in concert with other projects and programs under the Project 467 umbrella, demonstrates the Friends' investment of passion, expertise, time, treasury, and tenacity in seeking ecologically beneficial results via science-based human interventions. In the course of our work under the guidance of Creekside Science, we are practicing what is known as adaptive resource management as we learn and make adjustments to our approach. An unfortunate impact to the place triggered by the pandemic was the proliferation of illegal or social trails. It wasn't the coronavirus that caused these trails. It was an unfortunate outcome of the huge increase in visitors seeking respite from the lockdown. Many of these visitors were in Edgewood for the very first time and unfamiliar with trail rules and etiquette. The friends quickly mobilized a team to map the social trails, plan, and then execute mitigations to the damage. Second, people. It would have been convenient, even easy, for the friends to extend the suspension of our education and interpretation programs indefinitely and simply wait out the restrictions of the pandemic. However, this friends group has exhibited all the behaviors of adopto and the characteristics of a biological population undergoing adjustments or changes. We have joyfully leapt into a process of adjusting our structures to become better suited to the altered environmental conditions. That is, the conditions in which we deliver the inspired stewardship of Edgewood. In 2021, several new adaptive programs have been conceived, designed, tested, launched, and thoroughly enjoyed by participating volunteers and Edgewood visitors. These programs include trail ambassadors, this program has been running since March. Through the first three months of the program, we logged 100 sessions conducted by 24 different ambassadors. These volunteers encountered more than 700 visitors and offered to help with directions or plan identification. The trail ambassadors carry a card with a QR code and a link to useful online field information. Perhaps you've crossed paths with one of our wonderful trail ambassadors who are easily recognizable by their ask me button or quite distinctive face masks. Trail Tales. One of the challenges the Friends of Edgewood faced this year was how to help the public learn about the preserve when in-person programs like spring wildflower hikes were on hiatus and the education center remained closed. Unable to hike with docents, we pivoted to experimenting with new interpretive signs to see if we could bring some of those stories and facts about Edgewood out to the trails where visitors could discover them on their own. We called this initiative Trail Tales, starting with six to eight signs on a number of popular topics and the green grass restoration experiment as well. The signs are intentionally small, so they don't contribute to visual clutter along the trails. And each features a QR code leading to a web page with more in-depth information on each topic. We can measure the number of times each QR code is scanned so we can determine whether visitors are looking for more details, which will help us gauge interest in each topic. Edgewood Field Guides. If you want to learn more about the animals and plants of Edgewood, take a look at our Edgewood Field Guides at foew.org slash field guide. The guides are pr proving to be especially helpful during the pandemic when visitors cannot chat with a docent or go to the education center for information. The field guides feature many of the plants, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and invertebrates that are found in Edgewood. Field guide entries provide scientific information, photos, descriptions useful for identifying and understanding plant and mm -hmm. animal roles in Edgewood's ecosystems. Here's a sampler. Chestnut, chestnut backed chickadees work together to fight predators. The number of D's at the end of their chickadee bee warning call sends a message to the flock about how dangerous a nearby predator is. Female turret spiders can live up to 16 years of age. And the California buckeye has the largest seed of any native California plant and of any non tropical plant species. The Weed Warriors Dethatching Initiative. Since they've done such a great job clearing out invasives, the weeders have adapted a new project. 
They're experimenting with manual dethatching of stands of non-native annual grasses to make more room for native grasses and wildflowers. Here they are in perfect harvest scene, working to clear away a dense thatch of Italian ryegrass from the bottom of the Clark Cave Glen. They say that their COVID masks were actually appreciated due to the amount of dust. And some wildly popular and effective continuing programs to name just a few. The Wildflower Survey. This popular program quickly adapted to the March 2020 lockdown by adding links to online resources, a bird survey, and expanded notes, recordings, and sharing much of what makes Edgewood special across the seasons. If you aren't already getting the survey delivered by email, visit our website to sign up. Bluebird monitoring. Although this program was founded with bluebird boxes as the focus, several other species has decided to use the boxes and are included in the monitoring team's reporting. The humans in the program continued adaptations from last season when recruiting and training of new volunteers was put on hold. The veteran monitors recruited some family members to help out. And since the team couldn't gather in person to discuss problems and observations, they pivoted to email collaboration. Likewise, when key member humans dispersed or migrated during COVID, electronic data analysis became the new norm. As for the birds, well, last, season, last season's hatchlings fledged at 75% which was the second highest yield since records were started in 2013. In 2021, there were a lot of eggs and 91% of them hatched, but only 59 fledged. It was as if the adults thought they needed to make up for the drought years, laid a lot of eggs, but in the end couldn't find enough food for the babies. So far, the monitoring team has not been able to interview the parents. Edgewood Farms. 2021 is the second seed amplification year at the farms. To date, around 300,000 native plant seeds have been harvested with more to come. And that's just in this second year. These seeds make up our expanding boutique seed supply for use in the Greengrass Initiative. You'll see in a few minutes how important this project is for restoration of Edgewood's grasslands. And, Beyond these adaptations, I just need to give a big shout out to all the volunteers that continue to support Edgewood over the past year, scattered across nearly 40 different programs, activities, and jobs. We are so fortunate to have volunteers who just keep coming back to give and to give again. And our third priority is infrastructure. But before we go there, since we're looking at the beloved Education Center, Please know we're working hard to reopen the center in the near future and keep an eye out for announcements and more information. And I would be remiss if I did not admonish this audience. Please do not take this new boulder for granted. Or I could make the observation that our volunteers rock. Moving on, infrastructure. The pandemic has triggered many aha moments for all of us. A key realization was that the ways of Edgewood visitors who came seeking, sorry, Edgewood visitors who came to Edgewood seeking respite from the lockdown are new to the preserve, very diverse, of younger generations, often with multi-generational families and unfamiliar with Edgewood. The adaptive trait is critical for growing and sustaining our organizational infrastructure. This is characterized by a relatively small board of directors looking in the mirror and with humility and curiosity asking, how can we be better fit for the environment? Remembering that the adaptive trait has to be hereditary, transferable, functional, and produce increased fitness, we ask, what do we need to do now to ensure that the friends will continue to be a viable and relevant player in the restoration, preservation, and protection of Edgewood's natural resources? How do we continue to inspire stewardship of Edgewood for people of all ages and from all walks of life? How do we adapt to changes in our own population and shifts in the Edgewood visitors that we serve? We don't have all the answers yet, but we have identified our short-term challenge and it is board development. We need to add capacity, create more diversity, and ensure long-term organizational sustainability. So your board has put on the Adopto hat with a generous grant from the San Mateo County Parks Foundation 
or beginning the first phase of a board development journey. We will have a thoughtful exploration of diversity, equity, and inclusion as related to our mission. We will also be engaging with the county parks management team to strengthen our partnership and find more and better ways to support each other in achieving success in our respective missions. When we get to the formal meeting in a few moments, you will be asked to approve the addition of three seats on the board, giving us a jump start for addressing these challenges. And finally, a word about stewardship. Because Edgewood is the county's only natural preserve, there is a critical need to find the right balance between why external initiatives, such as wildflower, wildfire fuel reduction, trail safety and PG&E maintenance activities are needed and how they are designed and carried out in the preserve. We recognize that, that in this time, it is increasingly important to ensure that Edgewood Preserve is managed in a way that keeps humans and adjacent properties safe. For more than a quarter of a century, the Friends of Edgewood has kept a vigilant figure on the balance scale to ensure that the rare and endangered plant, insect, animal species are truly protected and that human interventions are science-based, properly permitted, and kept to a minimum. As we conclude 2021, we're making a priority to address these issues. We have so much hard work to do, and we are deeply grateful for your support. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce Crystal Niederer, Senior Biologist at Creekside Science. Take it away, Crystal. Hi, thanks. Thanks for that, Peter. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be here and talk about what we have been doing out at Edgewood. Um, you probably know Creekside Science has a, a few projects out at Edgewood. We've done the work with the Bay Checker Spot Butterfly uh, reintroduction and monitoring. We've been working um, with expanding the San Mateo Thormint uh, populations and numbers out there. And we have a few other things sort of scattered about uh, this has been a big project, the hydromechanical uh, pulverization. Um, it's been a, a big part of the uh, overall grassland restoration out there. So I will uh, take you guys through it. Oops, where's my, uh, my arrow's not working. There we go. Um, anyway, I'm kind of starting with the kind of the big picture of California grassland restoration. There's uh, a lot of groups out there, a lot of resources. Um, looking at restoration in California, and some have good ideas, and in some places things are more are more difficult and open ended. Um, there's really a lot of weed specific resources. Um, for example, if you um, you know want to tackle yellow star thistle or uh, maybe French broom or something like that, um, there's a there's you know manuals on it. A lot of a very straightforward. Um, processes and, and methods and options that are out there. Um, but of course we know that just because you get rid of one particular um, species, and, and sometimes that may be important to do, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna end up with a, you know, a super robust native um, community behind when, once you get rid of one player. Um, we've also done some work with serpentine grasslands and probably most of you know that uh, serpentine is chemically different, it's fairly uh, chemically harsh. And so within those sorts of grasslands, a lot of the weeds have a hard time taking, um, taking root, literally. Uh, so grassland restoration out on, on the serpentine tends to be a lot more uh, straightforward. Um, so we sort of got challenged by friends of Edgewood um, Let's start looking at our, our more fertile grasslands, kind of the more the normal, the more normal ones that are weedier. Um, and that is something that is definitely um, more difficult. And there are, you know, groups out there doing it. Probably the, um, the best at it right now are the California Native Grassland Association. And what they do, they have a very heavy handed model. They, they've used basically an agricultural model. So they go and they use a lot of herbicides. Uh, they kind of treat their restoration like, like you would be uh, planting crops. Um, so they'll go in, they'll get rid of all the weeds, they'll spray and spray and spray, um, and then just basically seed something in, kind of like you would do corn, instead you're doing purple needle grass and um, you know, maybe a mix of grasses, and then you can hit it 
with the, the broadleaf herbicides um, while you're just focusing on grasses. And then after a while, when you, you kind of get that stabilized and you put in um, more wildflowers or something like that. Um, I think what they're doing really works. It's great in the sites that they're doing it. It's not really the approach we want to take at Edgewood because we have so many things that we like there. So we don't want to just nuke everything and, and start from zero. Um, you know, we have sensitive resources out there that we want to protect. So uh, that that actually makes it harder to you know to be starting with a, in a better position makes it makes it harder because you don't want to destroy everything. Um, so we have to kind of uh, you know start in the situation that we're in. We're, um, so there's, um, if you look through the literature, there's um, a lot of different uh, studies and um, people doing projects, um, different land managers, different universities, all sort of trying to tackle uh, grassland restoration. And whether you're looking at the textbooks or the, you know, the meta-analysis that um, some of the leading scientists are doing, the take-home really ends up being that um, results are tend to be site and often year dependent. So it's really important that you um, sort of experiment and adapt, if you will, um, what you learn on the on the site that you're working at. And we've learned that through our own experience as well. And so having having known that, um, working with friends of Edgewood, um, they asked us to sort of um, come up with some ideas and sort of figure out what what is our toolbox? What are the what are the possible things that we might be doing if we want to start gearing up uh, our overall grassland restoration at Edgewood? And we came up with a whole list of different techniques. We had fourteen different techniques. A lot of these um, have been done at Edgewood by us, Creekside Science. Um, some we had done at other sites throughout the Bay Area, and a couple, you know, like some of the burns and stuff. Where you know we got data from Midpen or somebody else local, and so we you know, got all these uh, potential tools together, uh, discussed the, the advantages, the disadvantages. Um, again, if we had a result at Edgewood and sort of make conclusions from there. Something that was really interesting that, that just jumped out when we sort of uh, you know, looked at all these different things that we could be doing um, was that HMP had really had some long-term um, success at, at the site at Edgewood. Um, and I'll actually go into what HMP is in the next site or the next slide. Um, but in the meantime, we were, we were sort of looking at this data and we had, we had done some HMP years ago at a couple different places. And after four years, uh, we found that we had 29% native cover in our plots. And that's, that's actually really high. It may not sound high, uh, but generally in the, in more fertile grasslands in California, you might have one to 5% cover of, of natives. You know, you might have, you know, some poppies, maybe you have a little yarrow, maybe some fiddle necks or something like that, but they're just really notorious for being weedy. Um, so we were super excited to see this, you know, this, this really high cover at the site that we had treated years ago and that it was still persisting. Uh, there was about 10% native perennial forbs. A lot of that was yarrow and hillside morning glory. 18% uh, of the native annual forbs. So uh, that was mostly um, different tar plants. Uh, we had some of the dwarf plantain that the bay checker spots like, um, a few other things in there. Um, one, of the, one of the bad things about it is that it does create a lot of disturbance. Uh, so you have to really be careful about where you use this technique. Um, it's not magic. It's not like a one size fits all thing. It's something that really seems to work well where you have high native perennial cover. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. Um, so this is what it is. Uh, hydromechanical pulverization. It's basically just getting a pressure washer out there uh, with a special nozzle. This is just plain old water. Um, it's coming out at a, you know, high, um, High, high pressure. And so the idea behind this is it's one of uh, what we call uh, post-germination restoration techniques. So the idea with that um, is that you, at the beginning of the, of the rainy season, <laughs> it's got to rain, um, things start to green up. 
usually we would like to do this when we have maybe like an inch of rain or so. Um, and you know, you kind of get that sort of landscape scale uh, greenness. Um, you'll note here, there's there's not a ton of green here. It didn't rain much last year. I don't know if any of you guys noticed that. It seemed to seem to jump out to us. Um, anyway, so this was this was January of last year. Um, things were just barely starting to green up. We didn't want to wait too much longer because some of these treatments, we wanted to get seed on the ground. We just didn't want to wait too late. Uh, but the idea basically is that you, you let things green up, you get kind of that flush of new growth. And then you go in and you do some sort of disturbance. In this case, it's spraying it with this really high pressure water. And you're, you're kind of just um, scraping away or removing those first germinants. And where that works is in places where you have perennials that you want, native perennials. Uh, it, looks, it looks like you're killing everything. I mean, that's, you know, you're kind of ending up with this blank slate, um, but you want to do a treatment that doesn't kill the perennials that you want. Um, and you're sort of just wiping away those, those annuals. Generally, most of our annuals, of course, there's lots of exceptions, um, but generally in these, in these really fertile grasslands, they tend to, they tend to be weeds. Um, and then we're gonna experiment with um, seeding or not seeding. So the idea, the hope would be that the, the native perennials um, are not harmed. And then all of a sudden, you know, they don't have that competition from all the weedy annuals. So they're gonna bounce back pretty strong. And then if you're putting in some seeds, like hopefully they won't have the competition and you're um, really setting things up for success. So that's the, that's the big idea that we're aiming for. Uh, so, Again, we, we have tried this at different spots at Edgewood and also different um, other, other clients at different locations. Um, and looking at, of course, at the literature, knowing, knowing that different sites have different results. Um, so we decided we're, we're gonna do these eight different areas throughout the Edgewood grasslands with the idea being that each, each of these sites, even though they're very close to each other, um, are very different. They have different um, aspects. Some are north facing, some are you know, warmer and south facing, some you know, have some slopes, some are flat, some are wetter, some are drier. Um, and because of all of that, they have uh, different species composition. Again, even though they're you know, within a few hundred meters of each other in some cases. Um, so for example, we have the mule's ear meadow, which, uh, has a lot of mules here in it, which was something that we thought would do, would respond well to, to this treatment. Um, similarly, the, the Yampa meadow, you know, there's a lot of Yampa in there, not so much Yampa in other places, it's a little bit wetter, a little bit flatter. Um, you know, we wanted to see what would happen there versus, you know, the Danthonia meadow has more uh, the native perennial grasses. Uh, so all of these are, are very different sites, but we picked them specifically, again, because they had a, they had a fairly high cover of, of native perennials. And so our original thought was, you know, some of these are probably going to do really good and, you know, probably some of them aren't. And that's, you know, we're trying these very different areas. We're gonna, you know, collect all this data um, and wherever it works, we're, you know, we're gonna scale up. We're gonna adapt to that. Um, wherever it doesn't work, you know, we'll just kind of walk away and focus on, you know, the, the things that are working. So that was sort of how we were approaching that. So at each of these eight blocks, and maybe you've seen them as you've been out on the trails, uh, each block had six plots. Each of the plots were seven by seven meters or um, 49 square meters, about 50 square meters. And they each had six different treatments on them. Um, and these are what those six treatments were. Uh, so the first one that we're mostly talking about is the, the HMP, the spraying of water uh, with commercial seed. So we had a seed mix that we got from uh, Hedro Farms or a, uh, California-based uh, seed supplier. And uh, all the seeds that we got from them were from stock that was collected in San Mateo or Santa Clara counties. So it was fairly local. Uh, we did have some yarrow in there that was um, collected from stock at Edgewood actually, and that they um, increased for us. So they, we gave them, oh, like a pound and they gave us like 90 pounds or something. Anyway, they turned it into a large, a large amount 
Um, so this was our mix. Uh, we had Clerkia, Tidy Tips, uh, Lupin, some Dwarf Plantain, which is what our, our bait checkers about butterfly caterpillars ate, the yarrow, poppies, California poppies, uh, blue-eyed grass, purple needle grass. So kind of a mix of um, both, uh, you know, wildflowers, both uh, annual and perennial. Um, we have got grass in there and just things that um, are kind of kind of grassland workhorses that you might find in a in a range of um, a range of locations. Then we also did HMP with the boutique seed, and that was um, Peter had showed us uh, Edgewood Farms there. So this was a project um, that we got going for for this um, to to assist in this in this project in, the, in our restoration. Um, Perry McCarty's been kind of leading this whole thing um, with collecting seed of, of many different species out at Edgewood um, and the San Mateo County Parks put together uh, the farm down there by the day camp with a whole bunch of raised beds. Um, so Perry's been kind of leading um, volunteers propagating these plants and then um, collecting the seed that we can use um, in these restorations. Um, we also added in a scrub mow treatment, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, that was uh, kind of a new thing we made up. Um, we wanted to compare it with a spring mow since that is a very common uh, management technique in the grasslands. So we wanted to compare it to that. And of course we had control since we're, we're doing science here. We want to know, you know, what happens if we do nothing? You know, if, if our plots ended up looking really good or really bad in, in the treatments, we want to know it's from the treatment and not just the particular weather we had or something like that. Uh, so here we are out um, putting, a bunch of, <laughs> putting a bunch of water or hydromechanically pulverizing um, sort of this first flush of, of seedlings that are coming up. Um, you can see the, the stakes there, the blue with the yellow was the HMP plus the seed, uh, made these nice squares so we could really see the edges of, if, if the treatments were obvious. Um, and you can see there that even though we're, we're putting a bunch of water on there because it's at such high pressure um, and low volume, the, you know, we're not making puddles or, or anything like that. It is, it is a little muddy when we're done, but it's not, you know, nothing's running off. There's no erosion or anything like that. It's actually a really nice um, kind of blank palette to seed into. The top's kind of fluffy, um, it's really nice. Uh, so after we finish that and we have our nice squares, uh, we put the seed out, um, broadcast that, and we had help from the, the county parks interns. They were helping us do that. And we were spreading some rice straw on top, just a thin layer. And the, the main reason you do that is to kind of help with moisture retention. Um, I think it also probably helps a little bit with herbivory. You're kind of making a, a big buffet for birds to come in and eat some seeds. So I think that kind of, um, you know, is a little bit of a, an obstacle for those birds or whatever wants to munch on those. Um, and people do use it for erosion, although that really wasn't a problem here. Again, we had that nice seed bed that was pretty fluffy and was absorbing water well, um, and we weren't on anything terribly steep. Um, we also, as I mentioned, did the scrub mow. We were, we wanted to throw that in there to, to um, come up with something that we were hoping would be maybe a little quicker, maybe a little easier uh, than the, the HMP. Um, so it's just this metal uh, attachment that goes on a regular old string cutter um, and using that same concept of the post germination treatment where you let things green up a little, and then you're just sort of scraping off that top, you're disturbing that top layer so that those, those annuals that are on there are, are removed or killed, um, and that your perennials are, are gonna be able to survive that and go through without all that competition. And then of course we had one treatment where we were adding seeds. Um, we hated this treatment, it was awful. Um, it, was, it was hard to do uniformly, among operators, um, I tended to be a little more aggressive about getting you know rid of every little green thing. Um, so we really had to be talking amongst ourselves as to you know like how hard we were going at this. 
Um, and it was also, it was, to be honest, it was kind of dangerous. Like the, the, that thing would be rotating around and it would hit like a, it hit a rock or it would hit a bunch of grass or something. It would sort of stop and it would really jerk you. Um, so you really felt it in your back and your knees. Um, and I was quite pleased that none of us and surprised that none of us got injured. It was, it was tough. Um, this is what it looks like when you're done. So there's uh, that thatch just sort of stays in place. Whereas with the HMP, it's, you know, literally pulverized by the water. Um, so we, with the interns, uh, we didn't want to seed on top of this super thatchy stuff. For, so with, so for the seeding treatment, we actually raked it away and put the seeds out and then kind of raked a thin layer of that back. And we kind of justified that thinking if, if we did end up scaling that up, we would probably use like a leaf blower or something like that. Um, so that we wouldn't have to be, you know, raking an acre or more or something of this kind of material. Um, so I'll just, I'm just going to get into showing some pictures of, of how things responded. So as the, as the year went on and our tiny little bit of rain came, um, things did start to green up. So this is a picture of a plot that um, had the hydromechanical pulverization out in the mules ear meadow. And so you can see we didn't kill everything. Uh, and as we look in closer, um, yay, oh my gosh, there's all this mules ear. It was so awesome. Um, they really seemed to like the treatment. Um, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't damage them. And you can also see there's some other little native perennials in there. There's some, um, I think that's purple needle grass up here and probably some blue eyed grass in the front there. Um, so that was exciting. Over at the Yampa Meadow, uh, you can see those, the clean edges again, all of these treatments, you can see these nice clean edges of what was treated, what wasn't. That's good. You want to, you want it to not look like you had done nothing. So sort of to the outside, you can see how things are sort of greening up fairly uniformly. So usually that's, um, usually that's weeds coming in. If you get that uniform carpet look, you know, that's often your non-native annual grasses, um, sometimes other weeds. So in the middle there, seeing all that bare ground is actually pretty good. And especially when we zoom in, um, we see on the left, there's all that, all that is yampa. Mostly yampa it looks like a little bit of our native grasses there. Over to the right, we've got um, soap plant, chloragalum. So good, good stuff is coming in. Our native perennials are coming in and it's not just that solid green, which kind of looks good, but when you, when you know what you're looking at, it's, it's usually weeds. Um, here we are at the upper mules ear meadow. Again, a lot of, a lot of bare ground. Um, some good stuff. Okay, so on the left, we're happy. We've got a lot of yarrow. Um, and then the foreground there, that's blue-eyed grass. Those are, um, those are both in our seed mix, but because they're that big, we know that those were plants that were there before. They just don't grow that fast um, from seed in the first year. And then on the right, ew, we have a rhodium, which is um, Fillory Storksville. That little guy has the seed with the, the on that sort of spins around and the seeds always get caught in your socks or your dog or whatever. Um, so you can see that line across the, um, the middle of the right hand side there. So below was the area that wasn't treated and then above was where we did treat. So we, we definitely have a lot less erodium in the treated area. Um, but that's still quite a bit in the, in that amount, um, there, if, you know, if you didn't continue managing it, it probably looked like the untreated area in a year or two, something like that. So, um, you know, everything was perfect. Um, and here we have, um, hydromechanical pulverization plus seed. And then when we look in closer, um, the big plants, you can see some yarrow up at the top. There's some blue white or, um, purple needle grass kind of down the lower right hand corner. And then all these little guys at first, usually when you see kind of that uniform little guys, of, of, you know, a little carpet of green, um, I get nervous and think it's all going to be weeds. Um, but when you look close, if you know what you're actually looking at, um, these are mostly from our seed mix almost entirely. It was really exciting. So there's at the top, there's kind of those little gray guys. Those are poppies, California poppies. There's a lot of, um, Clarkia all in here. There's some little baby yarrow plants. Um, super exciting. Our seeding mix was really, was really coming in and, and a lot more than the, than the junk, than the junky little annuals. Um, here you can kind of see that square of yellow. I, I bet if you guys were out walking in the park, 
um, during sort of that key time into March, early April, you probably saw a bunch of those yellow squares and um, those are tidy tips. So that was in the seed mix, super pretty. Um, you can also, if you know what you're looking at in, the, in here, we've got a lot of those silver guys. That's the dwarf plantain that our bait checker spot butterfly caterpillars like. There's also a lot of clarky in there. Uh, again, so our, our, seed mix, our seed mix was really, was really doing well. Um, here's a kind of a typical scrub mo. Um, you can see kind of those little bunchy guys in there. So those, the clumps, again, are going to be our perennial uh, native grasses. So mostly purple needle grass in there. And we see some clumps too of uh, soap plant. Um, so that's kind of okay. wasn't as wasn't, wasn't as exciting as the as the HMP, but um, but yeah, we're seeing um, that our our native perennials are, are bouncing back there, and we're not seeing that that solid carpet of of weeds. Um, I've got a ton of data, and I I did sort of a dry run with part of the board last week, and put them all to sleep with all my graphs. Um, so we're just giving you the main take home graph here, the whole point of what are we doing and why? And, you know, it really comes down to, do we, do we have more native cover? Are we getting rid of some of the weeds? Um, and the answer is yes. So um, we can start here with the, the black line there. That's our control. That's kind of what happens if, if we don't do anything. Um, so we had 13% native cover among all of our control blocks which is actually pretty high. Again, we, we, we cherry picked these for, you know, sites that were, were pretty good, um, but that we thought we could make better because they had 66% non-native cover, which is a lot. Uh, and you can see that every treatment that we did uh, improved that. So that is exciting. Um, but the one that really stood out and that even has, you know, a negative slope was that light blue line. So we have more native, uh, the non-native cover with, with just that one treatment. That's the HMP uh, plus commercial seed. Uh, so we had 41% native cover and about 9% non-native cover. And you look at that ratio over there, the, not, the native to non-native, um, where we have 20% is the, is the control. Um, and then 467% kind of practically off the chart um, with our HMP plus commercial seed. Um, so we just got a really clear signal from this. And again, we, we did have some other graphs that really broke down things with, you know, looking at the perennial grasses and the invasive grasses and the this and the that. And um, everything was really supporting this. It was a very clear signal. And, um, and it was clear against across different blocks, which again, I wasn't expecting. I thought we were gonna be like, oh, some of these are garbage, we're gonna walk away. And some of these are fantastic, so let's focus on that. But we just kept seeing this clear signal. So it was really exciting um, to see that. Um, so our initial conclusions, um, again, were really that the, you know, the commercial seeds with, with the HMP, after the HMP were really the best throughout all of those blocks. And um, I'm being nitpicky and saying at Edgewood in 2021, um, again, things tend to be site specific, things tend to be year specific. Um, you know, we don't have any guarantee that um, we'll get these same results in different years. Um, I think the drought probably may have actually helped us. I think, um, you know, if we had had a lot of water, we probably would have had, you know, the weeds. Um, responding well to that as well. Um, so who knows? We don't know what's gonna happen um, in the next years, but we, we just got such a clear, uh, you know, a clear pattern um, that, we, that we feel reasonably confident going forward. Um, you know, we just had that best reduction in the non-native grasses and the non-native forbs. Um, the seeding really seemed to be important in keeping the non-native annuals down. Uh, the native perennials, we didn't wipe them out, we didn't kill them, they really maintained their cover and we're sort of expecting as, you know, as we continue to look, uh, you know, monitor these same plots in the future that those native perennials will even, you know, be expanding their cover. Uh, the scrub mow, again, was better than doing nothing, but it wasn't as effective as the, as the HMP and we were super glad about that because it was awful to do. Um, so good, we never have to do that again. Um, 
seeding was important. We liked purchasing those local seeds. We're gonna get a similar um, seed mix this year. Uh, the perennials in the seed mix uh, are, perennials always just grow really slowly. So it was really the annuals that were popping up um, as far as cover. Um, we definitely saw the presence of those perennials, but they were very, they were very small. Um, and that's, that's fairly normal, but being such a dry year, we're hoping that, you know, they're able to persist um, and get larger and larger as the years go by. And um, we definitely want to keep um, enhancing this with our boutique seeds from, from Edgewood, from Edgewood Farms and um, keep those going in there. Uh, one thing that was really interesting to me um, was that we didn't see a big uh, weed response to all that disturbance that we did. And I, and I think that's really a, a testament to what good a shape um, the, the grasslands really were in from, you know, all that, all that volunteer work, all the, all the work that the Edgewood Weed Warriors have done, you know, I thought, oh, are we going to see, you know, are we going to hit some seed bank of Italian thistle or yellow star thistle or something like that? It's going to kind of blow up and, you know, one block or the other. And it really, really didn't. Um, so that was that was exciting. I I think I think the weed warriors have just done an incredible, an incredible job. Um, so just kind of to reiterate, um, you know, it's really important to experiment. You know, the the exact place you're at. Um, you know, even the just these different blocks that were fairly close to each other were so different. Um, and it's it's important to just get in there and really kind of get some data and figure out what you're doing before you try to scale up. Um, but since we got such a clear a clear signal um, with this, we are planning in in 2022 um, or whenever things start to rain, maybe December or something this year, um, to start scaling scaling up and do um, actually close to six times larger of an area than we did last year. Um, at each, and we'll do at each of those blocks. We're not, we're not necessarily going to toss anything away because um, we didn't have any disasters. Um, again, just targeting those areas that have the high native perennial cover. Um, again, just having those those grasslands in good in good shape from the from the weeding was really was really helpful, and that the seeding um, was definitely important to keep those non-native annuals down. Um, so those were kind of my, my observations there. Um, we just want to say, uh, you know, thanks for your support, you know, from Creekside Science. Um, we've had some great projects and, um, you know, on a personal level, I, you know, this is my second career. I, um, you know, shifted careers a little over 20 years ago and I didn't quite know what I wanted to do exactly and was sort of fumbling around trying stuff out. And I, went out to Edgewood and was a volunteer weeder for a while and was just out there with, you know, Ken Himes and Paul Heipel and um, just getting so much information from them and, you know, just the camaraderie of, you know, the whole group out there. It just really um, inspired me, you know, to take care, you want to take care of Edgewood and, and other places in the Bay Area. And, you know, I just think Edgewood's such a, such a magical and, and special place because of that, the, the people and the resources are, um, really just amazing. Um, so yeah, yay Edgewood, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm going to hand it back over to, to Peter now. I don't know if there's um, an opportunity to answer questions or, or what you want to do there. Yeah. Um, let's see if people have questions, if they send them through chat, and then we'll try to work those in, in between our, our business meeting items. Thank you, okay. Crystal. That was fantastic. Um, I would like to uh, sort of move us toward our formal meeting at this time. And I just want to put a plug in for um, the group that is uh, dedicated to this green grass initiative. We have, we have a green grass planning group that's been meeting for a couple of years now. We meet once a month. And it really is what Crystal said early in her presentation. It's about experimenting and adapting a process to reclaim um, the grasslands that are not serpentine. So if this resonates with you and you have an interest, get a hold of us. Um, we always welcome more, more uh, talent and more um, energy into the green grass planning group. And uh, we figure we've got a we've got a multi-year project going here. So with that, um, thank you again, Crystal. We're now we've now arrived at the where our formal uh, general meeting 
for the members shall start. Um, our bylaws provide the legal and procedural framework for this important annual event. Your current boards worked hard to ensure that this virtual meeting is guided accordingly. So bear with it. Bear with us if it starts getting well, kind of formal. Um, and with that, I'd like to call the 2021 general meeting of the membership to order. We'll start the meeting by counting current members who are present so we can confirm that we have a quorum so we can proceed with business. So if you please indicate how many members are participating in today's meeting from your Zoom connection. Choose one on the poll if you're alone. Choose two if you're with your spouse or partner and choose zero if you're a guest and you're not currently a member. So the poll has been launched. Again, um, if it's one member or two or if you're a guest. Are we ready to close the member count? Okay. And Madam Secretary, do we have a quorum? Yes, we have a quorum. Fantastic, great. Okay, our first order of business is a change to the bylaws of the Friends of Edgewood, which requires membership approval. Our current bylaws call call for no fewer than nine nor more than 12 elected directors to serve three three year staggered terms. The board of directors proposes a change to the bylaws to increase the number of elected directors to a maximum of 15. This change will increase our capacity for board level leadership across our expanded programs and help us to include a more diverse perspective in the work we do now and into the future. I ask that our current members only please vote on this recommendation to increase the number of elected directors to the maximum of 15. If there are two members using your Zoom connection today, one of you can vote first, then we'll relaunch the ballot so the second member can vote. So that the question is, do you support a motion to change the bylaws to increase the number of elected directors to 15, vote yes or vote no. Peter, I'm sorry. Um, I think one of the co-hosts is accidentally closing the poll too soon. Uh -oh. I've only got nine out of nine right now. I think we need to run it again. Okay. Using Zoom can be such a treat. All right, so we have a fresh poll. If you could indicate your votes, and we'll leave it open as long as we need to. Are we ready to close the poll? Yes, I, uh, when it's still changing. Still changing. Okay. Remember, okay. we're going to relaunch for second members on the Zoom connection. Okay. So we'll close the first round of voting and relaunch the ballot so that member partners may vote if you're on the same connection. Remember, this is only for the second person. It's not a relaunch. So if you didn't vote the first time, you can vote this time. Okay. I think we can close the poll. Madam Secretary, does the motion pass? Yes, the motion passes. Great, thank you. Okay, we're now to the point of voting on the Friends of Edgewood directors who will serve for the 2022 to 2024 term. As the chair of the nominating committee, it's my pleasure to follow the recommendation of the committee and nominate the following. Lori Alexander, 
who's an incumbent, Nancy Ensminger, Peter Ingram, incumbent, Kathy Corbolt's incumbent, and Barry Moore, incumbent. At this time, are there any other nominations from the virtual floor? If so, please send a chat to everyone with the nominee's full name. Chat manager, have we got any nominations from the floor? There have been no nominations from the floor, but when you get a moment, we have two questions about Crystal. Okay. Presentation, thank you. We'll come back to those in just a moment. Yes, of course. All right, last call for nominations. If not, I would ask our current members to please vote on the nominations for elected directors for 2022 to 2024. You can vote for all nominees or only those you wish to elect. Uh, nominees must be elected by a majority of members present. So I encourage all members to vote for all, all the nominees they wish to elect. Again, if there's two of you, um, one can go and then we'll um, relaunch the uh, ballot for the second person. Okay. I think we can close the first round of voting and relaunch the ballot so that member partners can vote. Second poll is there for those who didn't vote the first time. I hope everyone who's eligible to vote has now done so. And if so, we can close the voting. All right, while our secretary tabulates the vote, let's, um, let's do the questions that have come through on the chat manager and then um, we'll move on with the last items. Fair enough, can you hear me? Yes. The first question was, why was the commercial seed so much better than the Edgewood Farms seed? Oh, um, literally that was um, the uh, volume. Like we, we bought a huge amount of seed and we put out a huge amount of seed. Um, and we just didn't have that, uh, you know, the, that's the answer. Sorry, I don't need to keep. <laughs> We had pounds and pounds of big bags of, of seed that we were able to purchase from a commercial farm, basically. And Crystal, the other question is, would you suggest using hydro mechanical uh, pulverization on serpentine soil as well? Um, that is an interesting question. And I would generally say now there might be times when I did. Again, you really want to go, you really want to pick your site well. Um, and it's where you really have an abundance of native perennials and probably fewer native annuals. So our really, our really nice serpentine that we have, almost all of the um, annual forbs are, are, are native wildflowers. And so we don't really wanna go in there and, and wipe those out with the water. Um, <clears throat> most of the non-natives that are out there are grass and so mowing works pretty well with them um, there's also grass specific herbicides that might work things like that there, you know there, there might be places where this would make sense on serpentine but for the most part we would probably be doing 
more damage to the native wildflowers. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. Shall we move on to the next topic? It's yes. a good one. This is the best friend for 2021. Are you all ready? It's Perry McCarty, the farmer. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Yay. so awesome. um, the nominating committee selected Perry for a whole bunch of reasons. So I'm gonna cite the ones that sort of bubbled up to the top. For his enthusiastic, consistent, and remarkably dependable service in a wide range of Friends of Edgewood volunteer activities before and throughout the disruption of the pandemic. For his many thoughtful contributions to the board since being elected in 2019 for his investment of time and talent since 2016 in many Friends of Edgewood programs, docents, checker spotters, bluebird monitoring, weed warriors, camera trappers, SOD blitzers, botanical buds, and there's probably the same number of programs that I'm not citing. Um, Perry just loves to get involved in all the different aspects of what we do. And for his full on engagement in Project 467, including his invaluable co collaborations in the Greengrass planning team, his amazing work piloting seed collection and curation, the creation of Edgewood Farms and the seed amplification strategy, his participation in milkweed surveys, the social trails response team, and the wildfire fuel reduction team, and especially for its infectious, inquisitive pursuit of connecting the habitat restoration dots. We salute Perry as our very best friend for 2021. And thank you, Perry. Um, we really appreciate all you do. Do you, uh, do you wanna say a couple words? Um, sure, I can do a little bit of that. Um, well, first, uh, just thanks a lot. So thanks so much. I really appreciate the recognition. Um, I guess a little bit else. Just from the beginning here, when I, um, I guess when I retired, I started just going out and hiking a lot more and quickly realized that I didn't know much of anything that I was seeing. And I, eventually I came across a little flyer somewhere talking about these, uh, the hike, the wildflower walks they did here. So I came to Edgewood and uh, from that learned about the monthly hikes they have here. And I went in one of those and uh, of the 12 people participating, nine of them were docents. And so during the tour, they were all saying, Oh, become a docent, become a docent, it's great. And I learned about that program during that hike and decided that seemed like I was interested in this stuff and the, and the burden wasn't that great. So um, I said, yeah, that sounds like maybe I'll do that. And then from that, started learning about all these other, the huge list of programs that, um, that, Peter, that Peter showed in his list. And uh, so each of them sounded interesting and I wanted to learn something about that. So this whole thing has been great and through that, met all these people, like learned like Creekside people who have give a scientific underpinning to all of this and people who are like from CNPS and some weeding and stuff, even when you're doing menial tasks, you have all these people to talk with about and learn a lot about the stuff. So it's been a great opportunity through all these programs to learn so much about the natural history of our area and, um, and, and history of the area and a way to uh, sort of a second chapter, the next chapter is to help contribute to all this open space around here that, uh, that I guess all of us really, really love. And so it really adds to quality of life in the Bay Area. So, so I hope to continue doing it. I saw there are a lot more opportunities there on that little chart that Peter gave. I think I didn't check off a few, so I'll probably be doing some more. So thanks a lot for the recognition. And uh, yeah, so thanks. Thank Hi. you so much. Thank you, Perry. Fantastic. Okay, our last item is uh, our secretary letting us know the results of the election of board of directors. Um, Linda, would you like to take it from there? Yes, all of the nominees have been elected by a majority of the members present. Again, they are Lori Alexander, Nancy Ensminger, Peter Ingram, Kathy Korbolts, and Barry Moore. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to check back with our chat manager to see if there are any uh, additional questions, comments to share um, before we open it up to 
finishing off the meeting. There are no new questions, just two uh, offers of congratulations to Perry. <laughs> nice. I did have um, I did have a direct question. I don't I can share it with the group. Somebody was asking, um, you know, like why why are we even bothering trying to have more more native than non-native? Um, so yeah, that's kind of kind of the the basic question, and it's worth um, sort of using that back as a touchstone. Um, you know, for me, obviously, like there there's so many just special sensitive resources at at Edgewood. You know, our, our bait checker spot butterfly at San Mateo Thornment and um, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch more, our, you know, Western dwarf flax and the fragrant fritillary and blah, 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 but white red panikita, all these things that are, are very easily outcompeted, of course, by, by, by weeds in the grassland. And so, um, you know, we do want to focus on protecting those and, um, yeah, just even more generally, there's, there's, there's so much biodiversity that we can lose if we just let weeds take over and, and, and push them out. And it's not, it's not just the plants, you know, there's, you know, different pollinators that are, you know, very specific to, um, you know, native, native things and, and not necessarily the, the more common weeds. Um, and then just knowing that we're, you know, it's obviously weed management is, is triage. We're not trying to you know, roll back time and, you know, halt weeds everywhere in the world and all this, but where, where we, where we have specific uh, places that are sensitive that um, are worth it and are important to, to really keep, keep that biodiversity as, as intact as possible. Um, those are the places we, you know, we want to target and Edgewood, Edgewood's a big one there. Um, and, you know, obviously uh, our native wildflowers are very pretty too. So there is just the aesthetic component on top of that. But, but yeah, this is a, this is a place worth fighting for. Okay. Crystal, you just summed up the spirit of the meeting very nicely. Thank you. So we have reached the end of our meeting. Um, and at this point, I just want to again express, express the full board's gratitude to all the members and all the volunteers for your incredible support. Um, if any of the activities you heard about today have a special resonance for you, let us know. We, we would love to have more people involved. Um, so now we're going to open it up uh, to all the participants for a few moments of open discussion and uh, conversation before we turn off the system. So uh, with that, again, thank you. And I think, Bill, you're going to just unmute everybody or people can unmute themselves, um, I guess is how it works, right? <laughs>